Uh, turn to Psalm 8, if you would, this morning. I'll speak, uh, just read the... Uh, I think that was Charles Wesley, that first song we sang, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing his my great Redeemer's praise. I know we have trouble with one tongue, but I know what he, he was saying. You know, we just, we, we can't say, you can't praise God enough, I don't think, ever. And uh, that la- one of the songs that we sang, too, the word stuck out to me, he gave us all for me, that I might live. And so what a, what a Savior we have. Um, I'll read the text here with us. You can follow along uh, with me in, in uh, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Hmm. It is a a passage here of praise to God. He begins this way, and I don't know, I think most versions do this, but if you have the first word notice for Lord is all capitals, right? And the second Lord is, is, is capitalized, but the rest of the words aren't. And it's helped us differentiate uh, between what it's uh, referring to. Our, in other words, the Lord all capitalized in your verse is really referring to Yahweh or Jehovah, which is it's just simply the covenant keeping God. This is the one he's for, the God of the universe. So he's saying, oh, Jehovah. Um, and he referred our Lord, he says. And then there are a smaller case after the first, the capital L, which means Adonai, the sovereign, the master, the ruler. And so that's how he's kind of referring, oh, Jehovah, our ruler, our master, our Lord. And so he begins this, this psalm by, by praising God, but he also ends it the same way. It begins and ends with God. And uh, it's personal. He said, oh, Lord, our Lord. Our Lord. Is he your Lord? I know I know. at funerals a lot of times I'm asked to read Psalm uh, 23, and it's a great psalm. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not be in lack of anything. And then it goes on to tell the benefits of those for whom the Lord is his, their shepherd. Uh, but people read it without thinking of that word. Is he, is he Lord? Though? They want the benefits, but they don't want the Lordship of Christ over them. But what a wonderful thing it is if, if the Lord is your shepherd. And here he's saying, do the same thing. He's saying, this is, this is my God. This is my Lord. This is our Lord. Those of us that are in Christ here this morning can honestly say, oh, oh God, oh Lord, our Lord. And then he says this, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Again, how, how majestic is he? How excellent he is? How great he is? In other words. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And, and I'm just praying that God will help me somehow in my weakness. Uh, talk out, brag on God a little bit. I don't think we can ever brag too much on him. How great, how excellent is your name. When it says your name, it's talking about the character of God. There's a psalm that says, those who know your name will put your trust in him. Right? If you know what God is like, if you really get to know the character of God and what he's like, you'll trust him. You'll trust him. As Bill Ryan used to say, who went out from his church as a missionary to Honduras, he said a statement that's always sticks with me. He says, uh, uh, not Bruce is the one who always says, God's never failed me. <laughs> and that's always been a, a one, but I, I just escaped my mind, tell you what vacation does to you. Um, God can do me no wrong. God can do me no wrong. 
And once you really know him, you trust him. And so uh, he said, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And he's talking to God. Notice that in this psalm, he's addressing his talk to God. Um, you are great. And therefore, what is, uh, greatly to be praised, right? Um, then he says this, you have set your glory above the heavens. Um, in other words, in the heavens, you see the glory of God. Uh, one of the NIV kind of puts it, you have set your glory in heaven, above in the heavens. It, it's greater than that, but it's in the heavens, right? In uh, Psalm 19, it says the heavens declare the glory of God, right? So as you look up into the sky, in fact, let me read that real quick here. Psalm uh, 19, I got my small reading Bible here this morning, so I'm using glasses. Sorry, I'm going to take a little bit. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Or the one I memorized that probably was King James is, there's no speech or language where his voice, their voice is not heard. Huh. It, it, it's an awesome thing that the heavens speak, doesn't it? I know of a few people that have come to Christ, or at least that was the beginning of their walk with Christ when they were looking at the stars at night. And they, they came to the conclusion, there must be a God. That was the beginning of their, their thoughts and their wondering. As the heavens declare the glory of God, it's a voice. It's speaking to us on this earth, if we but listen. Even Darwin had to acknowledge that at time. At the end of his life, he, he acknowledged that there's some, sometimes overwhelms him a sense that somebody made this. He said other times it just goes. <laughs> but he, uh, he had to come to that knowledge. Um, so the heavens speak. It's, it's like uh, somebody had said earlier, you know, it's like a giant billboard. We don't have those in Vermont, but in New York. And as I travel, I saw billboards everywhere and advertise. Sometimes they're great billboards. Sometimes they're horrible, but sometimes they're Bible verses uh, telling. But it, it's like a giant, the heavens, he said, it's like a, a giant billboard saying God is great. Just look, look up there. Giant billboard doesn't cost you anything. Just look at it, adore it and say, wow. Somebody awesome had to make these things, the stars, the planets, and so on. Um, this is to say, really, how, how great our God is. There are 200 billion stars in our galaxy. <laughs> I don't know all this stuff. I'm not a, but I started looking up just a few things here. And uh, the naked eye, they say, can see roughly 5,000 stars. Unclear. Obviously, if you're in the city and the lights are this, but the naked eye can see about 5,000 stars, they say. Uh, with a four inch telescope, I assume that's with the, the width of it, you know, looking up and magnifying things, you can see up to two million stars with a telescope. But if you go to a 200 inch mirror of a great observatory somewhere, and I've never done that, but I've, it's been something I've always wanted to do. On a clear night and look up and see, they say that you can see more than a billion stars. It just keeps, it goes on and on. And somebody wrote here, the universe is so big that if one were to travel at the speed of light, I think that's 186,000, something like miles. <laughs> it's, it's, it's big anyway. It's fast. I can't comprehend it. At the speed of light, it would take four, 40 billion years to reach the edge of the universe, considering the heavens makes us see the greatness of God. Even at night, some of the time, Dave and I have gotten cameras out and set them on tripods and point them up at the, at the sky and just leave it open for a few seconds, 20 seconds or whatever. Uh, and the, the camera's absorbing that light, what it sees. And I tell you, there's so many more stars at that when you begin to look at the picture, then afterwards that your eye can't see, the, the camera seems to pick up these awesome lights. And you just see so many more. And it's all to proclaim. And it's declaring. It's speaking to us, saying, somebody made me. God is speaking through that. God created the heavens and the earth. Um, then he, 
Uh, he says, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in, earth, in the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And he gets a, a real odd verse in the middle of this whole conversation. And he says, um, out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Now, let me ask just the kids a question. Uh, again, I'll read this part. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength. Praise, I'll say, probably more familiar to you. Uh, any of the kids, can you tell me where that might be in the Bible? In the New Testament, with the life of Jesus, where Jesus said that, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you've established strength or praise. Do you know anybody? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot again, but I, I know we got some pretty Bible literate kids here too. So. Do you remember? I'll start giving you a hint if you need it. Do you need a hint? Okay. When Jesus was coming to Jerusalem riding on a donkey, what were the children saying? Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, right? All right. So anyway, this verse kind of seems odd in here. It go, but if you think of it, this it's a contrast, really. Look at the heavens. Look how big God is. And then he points down to a infant and babies, he says. Helpless. Helpless little creatures, aren't we? I mean, horses, they stand up. Cows, they stand up immediately after they're born. When Claire gives birth today, <laughs> that baby's not going to get up and walk. It's going to take months. And it's like he's making such a big contrast between the glories of God and the power of God in creation. And now he takes a little infant and a little baby and he says, I've established strength through this. Um, what a contrast. Helpless, weak man and dependent babies and infants and so on. A contrast too also with the enemy, he said, the foolish and the, the self-sufficient, like the Pharisees and so on. Uh, <clears throat> all right, uh, you have established strength. So again, they were saying Hosanna, Hosanna, right? Who got mad when when the kids were all shouting that to Jesus? Remember, the, the scripture was for being fulfilled, Jesus said, and the disciples wrote that, that your king would come to you lowly riding on a donkey. And they were singing Hosanna, but who got mad because the kids were doing that? Anybody remember? The Pharisees, that's right. The scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day. And that's in Matthew 21, 16. And he said, they said to him, the, these scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, do you hear what they, they are, these are saying? Do you hear what these kids are saying about you? In other words, they were saying, here comes your king. Here comes Jesus, the, the Savior, the Messiah, God in flat, human flesh. The one who made the heavens and the earth is coming as king, but he's humble. He's riding on a donkey, and the kids got it. The kids were singing his praises. This is the one that everybody's been waiting for, and they couldn't shut up. And finally, the, the, the Pharisees, because they didn't recognize Jesus as, as the Messiah, look at it. Do you hear what they're saying about you? Do you hear what they're saying? Here's all these educated people, right? And yet, isn't it what Jesus did? He chooses the foolish things and the weak things of the world to confound the wise. And here are these wise, learned men, and they don't get it. Yet these children get it. And he's making quite the contrast. He says, do you hear this? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? I like the way he answered. Have you never read? <laughs> Psalm 8. Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Hmm. You never heard. It silenced the enemies. They had nothing more to say. He did many miracles there, and the kids were praising God. God healed. Jesus healed people there. And wonderful things were happening. He was getting the praise from these little kids. But the religious leaders were sticking, looking down their nose at these little kids and at Jesus. But you know what? They had nothing to say. There's no record that they said anything right after that. It silenced the enemy, just like the psalm says. And you know, I believe God still is doing that. He said, the Bible says he has established. In other words, some people say, we're going to wipe out Christianity. 
Others have said that. There, there'll be a time when there'll be no more God, no more Bible. But it can't happen. It, it's impossible. Because he says, I have established, in the mouth of babies and infants, I have established praise. That's why you have kids like uh, Xavier Kaiser, right? Um, what's your name? Xavier, Felix, Isaac, those guys. Hans always talks about that, doesn't he? They're singing at the top of their lungs in the barn, praising the Lord. They have more educated people come and pick up the milk and stuff, and they're not doing that. <laughs> but here it is again. God has established praise. We took a walk with Nadia and, and Marion and, and uh, the kids. I'll tell you, those girls sing. And they sing. And they sing. But so sometimes making up their own songs and stuff. But we're taking a walk. And, and as, I, as I read this passage this week, I thought to myself, you know, what's happening? Out of the mouth. Of these babies and infants, God has established praise. And you'll never hear the end of it. It'll always be that way. The foolish, the, 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 the weakest, confound the wise. And God has chosen this way through children. Through Aree's voice. Remember Aree when she was younger? She still got it though. Gives praise to God with a loud voice. You know the Bible says shout to the Lord all the earth. Anyway, so this will continue to happen. And in another place in Matthew eleven twenty five, it says, This same Jesus declared, I thank you, God, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Little children. There's a reason, he says, unless you become like little children. You won't enter the kingdom of God. There's a humility. There's a, a, a trust there with children. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, and why? Do, uh, let me just finish the first. I made reference to it. Um, first Corinthians 1. I'm going to read verse 26 and 27. If you want to turn there, I can just read it here. For consider your calling, brothers. He's talking to the church at Corinth. Paul's writing, and he says, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise, according to uh, worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, or of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in this world to shame the strong. And then it goes on to say in verse 29, So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. You can't. <laughs> you can't boast when we're so weak. We're nothing. And yet God chooses to use us. If anything else, it, it humbles us. It ought to humble us. And then he says, instead of that, and even in uh, verse 31, he says, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Nobody's going to get to heaven with bragging rights. <laughs> Nobody's going to pat themselves on the back and say, I made it. I did it on my own. I did it my way, as the song says. They only sing that one in hell. I did it my way. But let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And we ought to exalt him. So there's the contrast. And we'll go to verse 3 here, back in Psalm 8 again. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers... The moon and the stars which you have made, uh, have set in place. What is man? What is man? <laughs> Let me pause there for a, a minute and just say the work of your fingers. In other words, he's saying the world, this world that we live in was made. And when you, if you put yourself into this picture that he's putting before us, that your fingers. I mean, that, I, if you picture that in any way, you just see how small this earth is. And how big God is. And that's what is, the emphasis is. How great God is. But the fingers. Is, he's just saying somebody made this. You know, Mark carves uh, birds. And Mark carves a lot of stuff out of wood. And has helped some of the kids learn some. And, and I've seen some of the birds. And, and yeah, But, uh, you know, it tells me that some. I, if I, I wish I, I should have had it up with, with me this morning. You don't got one in your pocket, do you, Mark? Okay. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but 
Yeah, nobody would come away if I told you I was in the woods and I, I found a tree and a little stump there and I picked this up and I said, look at, look at what's just over time, what developed here. You guys would all think I'm nuts. Put them in the nut house. <laughs> and yet, that's what we're saying. You know, you go to school, they tell you this it just evolved and things happen. Nobody would say, look at that bird that, I, that Mark carved and say, this evolved into this. God's finger, Mark's fingerprints would be all over it. And God is in creation. Even in Romans 1.18, if you want to turn there, you can. Again, I'm sorry, this morning I had less time to prayer. Sometimes that means you read more scripture. <laughs> but uh, he says this in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their un unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived, clearly seen, ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so that nobody is without excuse. In other words, just like Psalm 19 said, God is, there's a voice speaking to the world. If you listen, if you just listen, there's no language where, where people can say, I didn't know there was a God. Even Helen Keller, who couldn't see, couldn't uh, hear, and so on, I think later on was asked about this. She said, I knew there was a God, but I didn't know his name. There's something that God speaks and his voice is heard, as it were, through creation. Somebody made this. If I told you this building evolved, you'd laugh me out of the place. But I look at this building and I say there was a builder. Somebody made it. And so this world, the Bible clearly teaches, there's no missing it. God created the heavens and the earth. The verse first starts out that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so nobody is without excuse. Nobody can say, I didn't know there was a God. No excuse. And then this verse, notice it says in verse 3 there, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. They're orbiting and their orbits are so are set there by God. Not by chance. And that comforts me because it was by chance. I was listening to NPR on the way here, just trying to stay awake and driving and stuff and uh, they were talking about the universe in there and some woman with a PhD and uh, she's probably been better off at a postal digger. But anyway, she she was saying about this world eventually is going to destroy itself. You know, the way things are set up. Well, OK, but God, God's I know what God, the Bible says. <laughs> God set these things in place. God set the universe in place. And, and I'm sure uh, David as he's and again, David must have watching the sheep at night. He's the one who wrote this psalm, and he's thinking he saw the stars at night. And this made him contemplate and write things like this. But if you go to Genesis chapter 1 with me, you know he had this in mind, and he knew about this even as he's writing. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, and let's see here, uh, verse 13, begin at verse 13. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. Okay, and verse 14, and God said, let there be uh, lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let there be signs for the seasons and for days and years. And let the lights be in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so and it's still so, isn't it? And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth. God set them in the expanse. And that's what David is saying in, this, in Psalm 8, doesn't he? God set them in place. God set them in the expanse to rule over the day and to rule over the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Hmm. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And so on. Hmm. God set them in place. I, I think 
we should often think of that. I, I think of it in prayer, in our own prayer, and I've shared it many times before we pray in prayer meeting. One thing that encourages me most uh, is that, like the psalmist uh, says in another place, I, uh, our help, our help, that is your and mine, our help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. I mean, that's enough to contemplate. I think of that so often when we're praying for impossibilities, when we're praying for difficult situations. But when you put it, things in perspective, you see how little our problems are, aren't they, compared to the big God that we have. I remember they were thinking about that when communism fell and a lot of pastors were getting together and they, they saw the enormity of uh, getting the gospel into this area and their problems seemed so, so big. And God seemed to be so small. And then one of them backed up and said, let's write on this board what God has done in the past. And they begin to write the things that God did, has done in the past, in their lives and in the life and what they see in the Bible. And they begin to write things down. And all of a sudden, God and their own begin to, to, to get big. And their problem of reaching the people with the gospel became smaller and smaller in the light of that. And we need to see our things like that. Our help. The help that we have comes from the Lord and maker of heaven and earth. And yet how few of us put that into practice when it comes to prayer. Join us for a prayer meeting. Join us where we get together and the kids pray. And ask help from the Lord. We help. We need it, don't we? We need it. And so we call on God for help. Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The scribes in Nehemiah. I've been reading through Nehemiah. And the Levites came and they told the people after they'd read the scriptures for a long time, they told the people, stand up and bless the Lord. That's a thing I would love to practice it here. They said this, stand up uh, and bless the Lord our God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. And then listen to this. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts. And the earth with all that is in them. And the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them. And the hosts of heaven worship you. He says, stand up and bless the Lord. He's worthy of it. And I've been in services before where everybody just stands up. And it's a one loud voice. Just everybody blessing the Lord. Wow. That's neat. And that's what they were doing here. Blessing the Lord. But again... Uh, with emphasis on on who made that he made the heavens and the earth. So when I look at the heavens, the work of your hands, he made it. He says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Again, because the devil will use this again. Well, who are you? I'm, I'm nobody. I'm weak. I'm frail. And in the light of things, I'm so small. You know, I, I saw it first when I was probably 19 years old or something, flying overseas to Europe. And, and looking down at night on the airplane from 35,000 feet and looking down even in Greenland and seeing little villages here and there, lights everywhere. And then I started thinking to myself, and I'm going to a village in Germany. And when I looked at all those people, I mean village after town, then we passed over London and you just see the expanse of the light spread out. And then you see... Munich, as you land in Germany, and then I go to this little town of Untermeiting in Germany, eventually to live for a while, and then Meiting. But anyway, I'm, I'm, the thing that struck me is, is, and it brought me to tears, is I can't reach these people. I'm one person. I don't even know if I can reach every person in my village. And it just made me see this is an impossible task. How small I am. Compared to the task. And yet how big is God? And God has a church worldwide. Does he not? God has his people. And he gives us tasks. To go different places. James and his brother I think wants to go to Ireland. Talk to me a little bit about Ireland. Where Dave lived for a long time. So reach the people. And I kind of got sidetracked here. Forgot what I was talking. What is man that you're mindful of him? Who are we? That you're mindful of, or the son of man, that you care for him. That you visit him, that you that you care about him. Interested in man. This verse is so encouraging to me. I don't know if it is to you. Other places in the, in the Bible is telling we're a vapor that appears for a little while and then we're gone. But here, what is man that you're mindful of him? In other words, God is saying, yet 
how big God is, how small an infant's and dependent on God, and yet God takes an interest in you. Do you ever think God takes an interest in you? That your God is mindful of you this morning. Put your name in there. God is mindful of Dan. Or the Son of Man, that you care for him. Why, why would God care for me? Who am I? Right? The song says that. Who am I? That the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name. It's humbling. It's humbling. Yet man is the only creature created in the image of God. Above all the creatures he made, he put he put the crown of glory on man. He said, you're the crown of my creation. I care about you more than I care about the birds. I care about every creature I made, but I you are more valuable than many sparrows, he said. Remember Jesus said that to the people? Aren't two sparrows sold for so much? And yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father, apart from your father. In other words, God even knows about the sparrows. You don't think he'll care about you. He says, how much more valuable are you than many, many sparrows? The crown of his creation. I don't know about you, but that humbles me. Who am I? Who are we? And yet, God created us to have a relationship with him. Do you have that today? Because that's what you were created for. If you do not have the relationship with God, you're missing the reason of your very existence. You're more valuable than many sparrows. Why did he say that? You know what I think he said that? He even said, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Okay, I don't have very many. Okay? But he knows how many I have. And he looks at Jerry there with a head full of hair. And he says, I know how many he has. He doesn't have to count them. He just knows them. Number. I mean, that's how. Why does he say things like that? You said that in the same context with the, the sparrows. Why did he say things like that? I think, I think part of the reason he says that is that when we're falling apart and we're, we're, when we're prone to wonder, does God know what's going on in my life? Does he care? Does he notice me? Does, is there any interest? God, can't you see what I'm going through? Do you remember that? I'm more valuable than the sparrows, many sparrows. He even knows the number of hairs on my head. Why wouldn't he know my problem that I'm going through right now? It's a test of your faith. I'll guarantee you that. This trial. And so he says, count it all joy, my brother, and encounter various trials. Because it's going to produce something in your life that can't be produced any other way. Patience. How else are you going to get it? And so on. I'm getting sidetracked a little bit. But, uh, verse 5. Yet you have made him, okay? He said, well, how are you, that you're even mindful of him? He says, yet you have made him, again, made him. We were created. Made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. We're different than the other creatures, aren't we? Man is unique. God placed a special honor on mankind. Even in 1 Corinthians 15 that I read often at funerals, especially at the graveside. And it talks about the human flat and the resurrection body its own. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 39, not all flesh is the same. Not all flesh is the same. I believe it. Uh, one kind, uh, one kind for humans. That's one kind of flesh. Another kind for animals. They aren't the same. They always say man is an animal. Here's what the Bible says. There are different kinds of flesh. Man has one kind, animals have another, birds have another, and fish another. We're different. And man has been crowned with glory and honor. And sets a special order, giving us a, a task to do. And that's what it talks in verses 6 to 8, if you want to follow along. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. Who, me? Really? Given little man? Yeah, I'm crowning you with glory and honor. I'm giving you a task here on earth. To give him dominion over the works of your hands, you've put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, 
Hans is a farmer. Bridget's father's a farmer. I've never seen this. I've seen I've seen people herd cattle, but I've never seen cattle herd people. Have you? I mean, it's odd, isn't it? It's not the order of creation. There's not one beast of the field that rules over us and herds us, is there? The cattle. And so he says this, I'm giving man dominion over them. They, they are over the, the sheep and the oxen and the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. In other words, and whatever passes through the paths of the seas, we have responsibilities here too. Man's been given this. And I think the psalmist is thinking of, again of Genesis 1 and verse 26. Let me just read that quick. And maybe you're familiar with it here. I wrote it down. And then Jesus said, or then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over the creeping things that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's no other gender, sorry to tell, despite what our society says. There is male and female, and so he created them, period. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sea. And of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Hmm. So there's man. There's man's place in God's created order. And it's humbling, isn't it? That God would choose mankind to do this. The earth belongs to the Lord, doesn't it? And he shows us how, what we should do with it. We're not, we don't worship the earth. Some people go that far and worship the earth, but we take care of it. We don't waste its resources and so on. And as we draw to a close, I'd like to read a couple more scriptures, and that one being Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 5, because this scripture is referred to here. So if you want to turn with Hebrews 2 verse 5. Um, Hebrews 2, 5 through 9. For it was not angels that the Lord subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. I like this. And this part of scripture gives me, give me uh, hope. It says somewhere in the Bible. Don't you like that? Because some people can quote verse in scripture every time to everything they're looking for. I can't. I said, well, I think it's in the Psalms. I think it's, and I love the way the, the writer of Hebrews just says there, uh, it has been testified somewhere. I know where it is. It's, uh, it's Psalm 8. I feel like I know more than the Hebrew guy. who. No. Uh, it's been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, right? We don't see it fully, fully developed yet. In other words, there's still diseases that we haven't conquered. There's still things in this world uh, happening and so on uh, with wild beasts, whatnot, that are, there's going to be a day when the lion lies down with the lamb. And then you'll see everything in subjection unto him. But anyway, on top, it, referring to us, but then it changes in verse 9. But we see him, and it's referring to Jesus, but we see him. We see him for, for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. Isn't that neat? That the God of, who made the heavens and the earth, who came down on that donkey and ride, rode humbly into Jerusalem, is the one who made the heavens and the earth. And we see him uh, now as a man. The God taking on flesh. The God man. Things are hard for us to explain. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely Jesus crowned with honor and glory. Because of the suffering of death. And so that by the grace of God. Not by anything I've done. But by the grace of God. He might taste death for everyone. And there's the cross. Hmm. 
He didn't die for the animals. He died for men, mankind, for you and for me. And so the psalm ends as it began here. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. He comes away with praising God. He, he, he's humbled by his role in humanity and, and how God has shown special favor to him. And all he can say at the end is again, O Jehovah, our or my ruler, my master, how majestic is your name. How majestic are you in all the earth? I see it. I see it now. And when God does something, he's displaying his glory. And he'll often use people, weak people, people you don't expect it some why so that he gets the praise and nobody can point the finger and say, I did it. And so it, it ought to humble us as it humbled the psalmist David. And this ought to encourage you kids. You can see the, how David knew Genesis chapter 1. And how it affected when he looked up to the heavens, it brought those scriptures he had memorized to light. And he could contemplate on God and then just worship God and praise God in return. And for us older ones too, you just see that, how, how it's useful in our, our worship of God, of our adoration of God. You can't praise God enough. I like the way the psalmist says something about... Uh, Declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night, at night. Just praise. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. And I've been, the Lord's been speaking to me about that. It's easy to get sidetracked in the busyness of life. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in there. Let me ask you this. Is he your Lord? Is he your master? Do you see him as glorious? You know, I'll have to admit, as a kid, I don't see God as glorious as I see him now. To me, it's an un, I, as I get older and as I read the scripture more, it, it's kind of like God's pulling back the curtain a little more. And he's more glorious than he ever has been. I praise him. So wherever you're at, he can be more glorious. Give him praise. Do you see him as glorious? Do you see that the, the majestic nature of this being yet he's mindful of you who are nothing and he crowns you with glory and honor made you in his own image so that you can have a relationship with him what can you say but what David said oh Lord our Lord how majestic is your name in all the earth let me read one last scripture and I promise I'm done with this scripture uh First Peter, let me read it. First Peter chapter 2. So it's the end of the Bible if you're new to finding things. Or First Peter chapter 2, and verse 6. For it stands in the scripture. In other words, this is what the scripture says. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. The cornerstone is a hymn. It's Jesus. I lay in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, a chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor of you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that was the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The stone, uh, the, they stumbled because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you, you are a chosen generation, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's why you can call him my Lord, my God. And a people for, I mean, that just ought to overwhelm you. I am God's possession. He's mine and I am his. Just like a marriage, isn't it? Shelly's mine and I'm hers. What a special thing. A chosen, gen a people of his own possession. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, our job 
is to proclaim how excellent this one is who called us out of darkness into his light. And say, hey, listen, there's somebody, somebody up there who's great, who made the heavens and the earth. And he knows your name. And he wants a relationship with you. You can't have it by earning it. You get it through a sacrifice where Jesus did everything. Paid for the price of your sins. Every crime and error, your rap sheet was <laughs> nailed to the cross. Oh, the bliss, like it says, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. We sang today the song about his cleansing. Aren't you glad you clean through the blood of Jesus? That he cleanses me, yes, cleanses me. And so, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. It reminded me of a song, we don't have to sing it, but I, I just, uh, who am I? That the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt, and so it goes on. Not because of what I've done, of who I am, but because of who of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. And then I like this, especially one of the second verse, it says, Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me in love? That blows me away. Who am I that the one who, whose eyes see my sin would still look at me in love? And yet this is our God. This is my God. This is a God that's worthy of praise from the moment you wake up from the rising of the sun to the going setting of the same. His name, the name of the Lord is to be praised. And if it stops, Jesus, even while well, the rocks will cry out then and give him praise. I don't want to hear that. I'm sure <laughs> it'd be glorious, but he's chosen humankind, mankind to share this. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven today, we're humbled by your majestic power. Your invisible attributes, Lord, have been clearly seen. There was a power that made the heavens and the earth. And we see that it was somebody divine. It was God who set the things in place. And yet you chose with human beings to show special loving kindness and mercy and grace. And you display it often. And we want to praise you for it, Lord. Let us be more and more in awe of your greatness and humbled by our position in the order of your creation. And Lord, let us then cause us to serve you in a manner worthy of the God who called us. And so, Lord, I just pray for your help this week as we go through it. May your name be praised. May you be glorified. Even in this last song that we sing now, God be praised, we pray. And you are definitely worthy of it, Lord, again. And I pray continue to be with everyone this week as we go through this week. Looking to the, uh, and realizing that our help, if we're going to get any help from above, it's going to come from the one who made the heavens and the earth. Oh, Lord, I thank you for answering prayer. That the same God that put the created order in, in the heavens and the earth comes to our aid and helps little old me. And so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the musicians will come and we'll close with a song and you'll be dismissed. So.